Greetings, everyone. This is the Youth Tahe Show, bringing you again one of the topics that we all of us, especially if Ethiopians are Eritreans, that we have to really discuss and understand. Uh, so thank you for joining us. For all who are watching online, please share with your family and friends. And today we're discussing HR 660 and then S3199 belts, how it does affect us. I want to be very, very clear. We're not here to say there are not human rights violations or anything that needs to happen right now. There are a lot of atrocities that are happening right now in Ethiopia. But this is not the way that we allow the US or any other Western countries to govern, to tell us what we need to be doing and coming and hiding. They are wolves under, hiding under the ship's skin. This is a very dangerous, they are dangerous bills, all of them. We need to understand it. What does it do? How does it affect us? we need to be able to be very clear before saying we support these two bills. And there's a historical aspect all of us are gonna be discussing tonight. Whenever the US government is putting sanctions from Cuba, Venezuela, we have seen it in so many places. It did not help at all. It did not hurt the government, but it hurt the civilians. We need to be very, very clear that we are discussing about. So we'll talk about the different bills. I have several guests here with me. And one of the things before when I get started, I wanna be able to say to all of you, even us sitting here discussing our voice, our exper experiencing in an American land, this bill can affect what I'm saying today if it does pass. So we need to be very careful what we're supporting just because we hate the government in Ethiopia and supporting this bill is going to be bringing a long-term impact from generation to generation. Cuba has been sanctioned for 50, 55 years, and it doesn't matter what government, Democrats comes, Republican comes. Once a sanction goes on, it can go on forever. So do not be fooled. Listen, don't be emotional understand the bills. I have posted them on my page so that you can all go in and read and be informed and be educated before you say, I support this bill. So let me bring you back again to my guest. We have amazing guests that we're going to be talking about. First and foremost, I'm so honored to have Deacon Yosef in here. So I'm going to start with you. It's an honor, Deacon, that you've been fighting this fight for a long time. And it's an honor to have you here with all of us. I don't think there is not any Ethiopian or Eritrean who do not know. I um, mean, there are so many things that we'll be discussing with you. So, uh, but before I go on to any other guests, let me start with you. For those who don't know you, maybe you can do a little bit of introduction. Once again, it's an honor for me to have you on this show. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you for inviting me this evening with your honored guests. Uh, it's, it's a privilege for me to be part of this discussion tonight. Um, my name is Deacon Yosef Teferi. I reside here in Denver, Colorado. Um, I am uh, uh, currently uh, the chairman of Ethiopian American Civic Council um, that has been uh, around for a good uh, six, seven years, uh, essentially, uh, uh, representing our interest in uh, around the, the policymaker circles uh, in Washington. And um, so um, yeah, it's an honor for me to be here tonight on this, uh, on this important topic. Thank you very much. And then we have a special guest also, Rashid. But thank you for joining us here today. So Rashid, my brother, it's an honor to have you here too, if you can introduce yourself a little bit. You're muted. Thank you for the warm introduction. And it's such an honor to be here with um, Ethiopians who are so patriotic and they love America and they love their homeland. and They're working very hard to do uh, the best that they can for their country um, and their homeland. Uh, so it's an honor to be here. Rashid Walters, um, based in Boston. Uh, son of West Indian immigrants, first generation American. So I could definitely relate to, you know, a lot of the struggles of um, not only immigrants, but those who are the children of immigrants. Uh, private equity is my, is my business um, and also food distribution. I'm here uh, because I'm deeply concerned about our country being involved 
um, in matters that uh, that do not really uh, best support our national interest. And, you know, coming from a West Indian background, we have always been very close to Ethiopia, being able to see Haile Selassie as uh, a black king when we were in colonies where we seen pictures of white kings and white queens. It was Haile Selassie that gave us so much strength and so much self-pride uh, by seeing um, a black king and we have always had very close relations with Ethiopia. Uh, we all, as children, um, we all have one Rastafarian in the family. Um, we're always hearing Bob Marley. So it's just an honor. I feel like we have to give back to Ethiopia for the, the positive imagery that you have given us. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. It's an honor to have you. Let me go to my sister, Mame. And uh, so you can introduce yourself, please. Thank you, uh, Yoftahi. It's great to be here once again. It is an honor, uh, especially to be on a panel with Deacon Yusuf, as always. Um, I've known Deacon Yusuf for many, many years, and I have nothing but utmost respect. So thank you for everything you've done thus far and continue to do. We all have an amazing and enormous amount of respect for you, and we're grateful to have you in our community. And amongst everybody else here, um, to have the opportunity to add my voice to yours. Not that we or I claim to know everything, but at least I can contribute something is my end game. So thank you Yoftus for having us and uh, giving us the opportunity to at least share what it is that uh, we know and like to share with others. So thank I, you. I live in Denver. I'm sorry, I forgot that part. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, my brother Fisaha, an amazing professor and, and, and who has so much to offer for this world and uh, deep down so much knowledge that you have to offer. So fish, it's, I mean, I know I call you fish, so, but fish to make it more professional, I'll do that. <laughs> and it's an honor to have you here, my brother. So if you can introduce yourself. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you fish, uh, really. It is definitely, again, an honor to be with this panel. And just like my, you know, sister Smami mentioned, and I'm absolutely honored to be with Deacon, like I mentioned earlier, that I have been hearing, you know, a lot about his, you know, voice and what have you. And again, thank you. Uh, my name is Fisaha, um, and I am born and raised in Ethiopia, but I've been here for the past uh, 20 plus years here in America, and I made America my second home, a country, a nation that I have never felt that I, you know, that I am a second citizens. But we here as um, Ethiopian American to voice our concern with this nation is uh, implying on a nation like ours, Ethiopia. So um, using our, you know, given rights, the democracy that we are actually have. Uh, we need to actually uh, make sure we actually vo uh, voice our concern and uh, really, you know, uh, to make a point on what is happening. And if we do that, if we come together as one people, as an Ethiopian, as, you know, uh, African-American, as in diaspora, I think we can do a lot together. And uh, we have a power, we need to know our power, it is on our hand and we can change. And there's a reason why we live here and there's a reason why we make our voice here. And that has its uh, uh, weight and it's important, uh, you know, uh, that we are actually come together to concern our voice and bring, you know, uh, the people around this uh, important bill that's actually drafted that can uh, have a in a determined uh, effect on Ethiopia. So again, thank you, uh, Yoftesh, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. So uh, before we get started, sometimes we get confused because there are House bills, Senate, what it is. So for people to understand, Rashid, if I can come to you quickly, um, for some people who are not really familiar with how the US uh, politics is structured, what is the House, what is the Senate? <clears throat> Muted. I apologize, no. uh, but the House and the Senate are two different bodies that make up our Congress. Um, the House is about 435 members, 
um, and the Senate is about 100 members. The, these determine every state has two senators, um, and many different states have different numbers of House reps depending on their population. But in the Senate, everybody has equal representation. In the House, it's a bit different. Um, both bodies need each other. A bill cannot pass the Senate and um, not become a law and become a law if it does not go through the House. And if a House bill passes, it has to go to the Senate. So it's vice versa. Um, and once they pass through the Senate, uh, the Senate or the House, they both agree on one piece of legislation that goes to the president for him to either sign into law or veto and send it back to be um, either voted into law or voted down. Um, pretty much how bills work is they go through various committees um, in relation. I know I'm not going to be um, digging too much into the bill. I know somebody else is doing that, but uh, with this particular, with these particular bills, they have went through appropriate committees. Once they go through committees um, that represent that particular uh, subject, it becomes passed and it starts and it heads to the um, the majority leader of the Senate and the Speaker of the House to be voted on by the members. So, okay. so who can who can introduce a bill? Um, to the the Senate or the House, anybody can. Um, the, a senator could introduce a bill, a representative could introduce a bill, um, citizens could introduce bills, um, so presidents could introduce bills, so the bills could be introduced by anyone. So, thank you. We'll come more deep in that as we go. Uh, Deacon, let me come to you. Before when we talk for, about HR 660 or uh, S3199, there was an article, I believe, 6464, that you fought to get... Uh, um, not voted on, not to become a law, and then this is sneaking in into HR 660 that I see. So if you can explain to us, because you were very instrumental in making sure that didn't get to pass, I wanted people to understand a little bit of that article, if you can really, if you can cover a little bit of that, please. Okay. Uh, essentially, uh, the House, um, it's, it's actually a continuous bill, and it's a bill that, uh, it's one of the largest bill that Congress deal annually, and it is uh, for the appropriation of the Defense uh, Department's budget for the fiscal year 2022. So you can imagine there's thousands and thousands of pages of uh, documentation. I mean, they're basically authorizing close to a trillion dollars worth of budget. I think it's like 700 billion or something that and, and it it contains so many issues. Um, it it is a vehicle, a special vehicle, for interested parties in Congress to tuck in their own special interest to be voted through this particular um, bill. Um, most people don't read it, um, and so. We come to find out, it's called HR 4350. Um, we come to find out that Article 6464 pertains to Ethiopia. And mind you, this is nothing to do with Ethiopia, uh, but it's like a, a pet project that many people uh, in Congress have utilized it and they call it, they call it uh, the pork barrel, essentially. Um, you know, everybody has their own little project here and there. Um, they have a hundred million dollar uh, project that they want. And, and without to debate about it, without to have any conversation, in some cases don't even know who did it. Uh, when they pass this behemoth bill, and if, if somebody doesn't discover it, Essentially, what happens is it becomes part of the the bill, and if it goes through the Senate and uh, the senators essentially uh, agree with it and goes through the president's desk and he sign it, um, like Rashid said, it becomes part of the law. And and then if it is an issue, um, for example, in this Article sixty four sixty four regarding Ethiopia, it basically ask the same thing that what HR 6600 is asking. And essentially what it was is that uh, they want uh, the State Department to come up with a legal determination 
of labeling or finding Ethiopia as a country that have committed internationally recognized human rights um, atrocities, including genocide. Um, you know, it, it's highly condensed, few words. It's probably um, a couple of paragraph and not even a full page, but remember this indictment on HR 66 makes that the fundamental premise. And therefore, whatever the things that they were planning and we didn't know who did this, that did this, um, now we do, but then we didn't know. It already passed the house, arrived at the Senate. Um, the folks, uh, uh, Ethiopian Americans in Boston, including yourself, and I wanna give you credit for that, for bringing that to our attention. We didn't know, even know about it until uh, you, Atoyoftai, said, there is something we have discovered and then we took out, take a look at it. Uh, as we were frantically trying to find a way to stop it in the house, it was already voted on in a few days uh, and then went into the Senate. And that's when we were able to uh, get uh, Senator Jim Inhofe, our longtime friend, uh, to basically remove that article from that defense appropriation bill. Little that we knew, um, the authors of this were in fact, are in fact, uh, what now known to be the uh, congressional leaders and particularly the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House and the Foreign Relations Committee, Committee in the Senate, who basically co-wrote this whole thing. Um, and so when they came back, uh, it became a resolution uh, on steroid regarding to Ethiopia, okay? so. We were able to stop it uh, back in December, so it wasn't going to be a part of the law. And I think that was a good thing, but yet uh, the authors came back with vengeance. Um, this time it's a full-fledged sanctional uh, resolution uh, in both chambers, and therefore it's gonna be extremely, extremely consequential bill if it ever passes on the floor. That's the genesis of uh, the question you asked and how it relates to the current uh, resolutions. Yeah, thank, I, thank you very much for explaining that because I wanted people to understand sometimes we're chasing bills after bills. It's like sometimes you get thrown a bone, you're chasing there and then they're working behind the scene. And nobody should forgot, forget there's TPLF is, is playing with $30 billion that they have amassed that this is a full-time job. All of us are trying to volunteer, take time, do A, B, C, D when they have full-time staff doing and going and paying. And at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to follow the money because any of the senators, they know what they're doing and they know what they are being paid. And then at some point, we're gonna to have to discuss also why, you know, like people like um, not only the Senate, but also the defense uh, office and everything else, like, so much breaking down. And then the interest, we, it's, it's really impossible for me something to understand. What is the interest? why so much uh, involvement from the U.S. government? I mean, I'm, I know we see it at least now what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. So I don't know if you have arrived, why are they so involved, Deacon? From what we have seen, you have worked so much with so many senators or representatives. Why this much attention to Ethiopia? Okay, <clears throat> so Let's uh, break it down in terms of what took place over the last three, four years in Ethiopia. What has happened in the global um, economic uh, output and the shifts that we're seeing uh, and how that made um, the region that we're in, the Horn of Africa, that much consequential. Um, and also uh, the United States in its uh, at least from the onset, um, never, never wanted the TPLF to be removed from power. But so here's after 27 years of um, brutal rule, um, essentially the people said we had enough of this. So the country became ungovernable and the security risks that was paused uh, to the U.S. interest in the region and in Ethiopia uh, compelled them that maybe this is time to sh uh, change the guard, so to speak. Um, they looked around and they haven't seen uh, 
a capable op opposition party to speak off. Um, and so what they decided to do is to, 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 to see within the ruling party, which is known as EPDRF, uh, if there were any leaders that could possibly consider it a reformist acceptable to the populate, to the people of Ethiopia and still uh, represent the interest that the United States has of in, its interest, geopolitical interest, and also the national security interest in the region. Well, they did not want, obviously, TPLF to abandon the city and uh, move back to uh, Magali. Uh, that wasn't part of the planning. They really wanted them to stay relevant uh, as being a body within the ruling party, but that did not happen. It didn't please them. Then they start to pay attention more closely to now to the new reformist leaders that have uh, um, surfaced and uh, many of the things that the United States wanted to, 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 to uh, take place, um, what they had accustomed to over the previous 27 years um, that literally that uh, the TPLF has gotten used to, uh, yes, sir, We'll do anything you ask. Um, you know, we uh, we call it Talala uh, in Amharic, and essentially, um, it's a, a yes man um, puppet government that they are used to. Um, they fa faced somewhat um, some resistance, uh, and they tried to to work with them for a, go a good two years, uh, and made a decision that this is a little bit of a more than they can uh, manage uh, in terms of uh, really accepting them. Uh, in other words, they became more nationalist than they bargained for. And then they come to find out later on that uh, actually there is uh, an interdependency of possibly creating a Commonwealth um, uh, group within the, the region, particularly with Ethiopia and Eritrea and Somalia, and possibly even including South Sudan which by the way still is on the table. And uh, this was done without uh, United States knowledge or um, um, approval. And they didn't like that. Uh, they're extremely suspicious of Eritrea in particular. Um, so all of this dynamic has taken place in Ethiopia. So when TPLF attacked in 2020, it was with a full knowledge of the United States. And the fact that it took place on the day when the United States presidential election was taking place was not a coincidence. You know, it, they, they knew that the world's attention at the time would be on the US election and that it would give them a cover for them to do. And by the way, they pretty much determined, uh, you know, they financed them over the years. They militarily, uh, they equipped them, they trained them, and they're capable, they are uh, uh, good aware with all, with in fact that, that, that TPLF is capable to be able to overcome the challenge at that time. So to make the story short, um, things didn't go work out as they planned and what they hoped for. Now, if you therefore come, you know, fast forward to the present, they, uh, they find uh, the um, TPLF on the defensive. The first um, sign was the fact that when Ethiopia declared a unilateral uh, ceasefire back in June 2021, um, the United States, uh, first of all, uh, did not believe that if this is going to, that the Ethiopian government was going to stay put with that decision. And so, they sort of kind of gave TPLF that they can, um, they don't have to accept the ceasefire. And of course the TPLF went further and advanced to the Amhara region and the Afar region. And I won't bore you with the detail because you probably know more about it than myself and many Ethiopians do. Um, so when the counter uh, offensive started late uh, November, December, there were clear intelligence report that Ethiopia is, uh, is going to win this. So uh, it was no coincidence. 
uh, that even when we met with some uh, high um, officials at the State Department, they kind of, it's trying to indicate to us, the first thing they say to you, I mean, this is just a standard polite way of that. Uh, we don't take side on this issue, um, but we believe that Ethiopia has an upper hand uh, militarily. Um, we have no say, or we can't tell TPLF to stop their aggression or whatnot. These are just uh, a standard boilerplate argument they put forth. Okay, so, but there is some truth to it and to the extent that the United States intelligence report clearly indicates that Ethiopia has amassed, amassed uh, enough force to repel um, TPLF back to its uh, region. Well, if I take you back four months or five months earlier, in May 2021, Senator Bob Mendez, the Senate Foreign Relations Chairman, and uh, Congressman uh, Gregory Mix, who is the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in the House, got together and co-ed a very telling article how they view what's happening in Ethiopia. In that article, this is May, it was almost a year uh, earlier, they basically have concluded, uh, because this, uh, this is at the time when it's still the Ethiopian forces was inside the region, in Tigray region, and uh, the rebellious was put down, is that they have basically um, articulated their plan and how to deal with Ethiopia. And that's when they've said, that Ethiopia has committed atrocities, internationally recognized human rights violations, including genocide. And mind you, this is um, this is very early on. So when you come back then to November, and when the intelligence reports pretty much confirmed that in this in this at least the the current uh, war theater. Uh, in the northern Ethiopia, that Ethiopia will, in fact, uh, um, will be coming uh, 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 victorious. Um, that was when HR 6600, or what we call S3199, was conceived. So many people don't know this, but HR 6600 did, did not start at the house. It was actually drafted in the Senate by the same fellow, which I told you about that who co, co, co with uh, with um, uh, Gregory Meeks uh, back in uh, May, 2021. And the, this is where we stop and see, how did this thing go to the house? Well, there's a, a process uh, of a resolution, uh, whether a resolution could be a simple resolution that Categorically, will become if it gets adopted, uh, will not will be uh, a non-binding resolution. It basically gives the sentiment or what it thinks of a situation. So, if it was to be say adopted in a the House but not in the Senate, or vice versa, if it was to be adopted in the Senate but not in the House, it will remain as a simple resolution. A joint resolution, however, functions like almost like a bill. Okay, so if you put money in it and appropriate funds to it, it becomes a bill. But other than that, it essentially the House develops it and passes its chamber, goes to the Senate, or or similar bill like it, what they call it a companion resolution, can be drafted for the Senate with minor change here and there, and are waiting for that. House, lower house, or the House's uh, um, resolution to arrive to the Senate. And uh, what they do is they, they make a reconciliation between the two and come up with a common um, provisions and languages uh, acceptable to both chambers and presented in the Senate to, to pass. And if it passes that, um, it usually goes to the president's desk uh, for his vote uh, and to sign it into law. So this, that's why this thing is very consequential because once it's implemented, 
then the process of, of reversing this can be a task of a generation long, okay? Um, so it, it all the premise is basically exactly like you said, Article 6464 and HR 4350, uh, that uh, we were able to defeat in the Senate back in, in November in that defense appropriation bill, except you've got all the provisions, the demands, um, the conditions, and if Ethiopia does not accept that, then comes a litany of san a sanction on Ethiopia that is unlike anything we've ever seen. Um, uh, usually the United States... Uh, um, you know, from what I've heard, um, I haven't read anything to confirm it, but what I've um, have been told has limitless capacity of sanctions. And someone mentioned over 60 levels of sanction they can put on. And they usually starts with a simple threat. Um, and then they just basically squeeze, you know, the tab. Uh, that's what they're doing, for example, in Russia, as we speak. Every single day they come in and they say, we have an addi additional sanction regime that we are gonna adapt on, 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 uh, uh, on Russia. Well, in Ethiopia's case, in the case of HR 6600 or S3199, they look like they have basically threw everything all at one time. Okay, so they went from zero to whatever they can throw at us. Okay, now. I swear to if I can interrupt you quickly, uh, sorry. I mean, I posted the bill so for everyone to be able to read it so that I can respect your time. The bill is so huge. I'm glad the way you said it, they threw everything at it. And at the end of the day, when people are talking about there are a lot of violence that we have never heard of that's happening in Ethiopia. So it's going to have to be coming in disguised through that. When I started reading the bill at first, it looked like, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with this. This is exactly what I want to see. This is what needs to happen. The prime minister needs to be held accountable. People are suffering in Tigray, suffering in Amhara, suffering in Afar. They're suffering everywhere. So we cannot sit down and deny any of that. But what I have read, I think going through, I think there were three things I was able to pick up. I think one was even us, this discussion is going to be a questionable mark that they can put. Um, building, as we know, so many places have been um, financial support that Ethiopia can get. And then the other one I have seen was like more the in technology, even transfer that can be limited. So if for people to understand, we're not opposing any kind of humanitarian questions that needs to be placed. If you have to highlight why should people uh, really oppose this bill, if you have to break it in three or four part, which areas would you be able to address, Deacon? Well, okay, so uh, it, by the way, uh, uh, President Biden um, said it well. Uh, he basically said, I'm not gonna put any sanction on Ethiopia that would hurt the people. And he said, that's why today, and this is on September 17, 2021, that I am putting an executive order to put sanction on Ethiopian and Eritrean leaders, select members of the leaders, um, and basically gave that task to the State Department and to the Treasury Department, which is IRS. And essentially, it is a form of the, Magnet, the Global Magnitsky Act, which is essentially if you've got a foreign government leaders and oligarchs who've got money outside of their country, they seize their assets, their investments and whatnot, and they restrict their travels and so on. The trouble was about three months later, uh, IRS came back and said, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't find anything, okay? So there you have it, okay? So whatever they can throw in trying to put the, the, the leaders of each of those two countries pay so that the ordinary Ethiopians do not have to pay the price, that, that bus has left its station. And they came back and they weren't uh, ashamed of it. And they said, well, uh, that didn't work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna erase Ethiopia from Agoa. And trade groups, civic organizations, everybody says, this will hurt the, directly the very people you, Mr. President, have promised not to hurt to the tune of 300,000 
and uh, uh, ordinary Ethiopian citizens that are going to lose their job. I said, I'm going to do it. So at the end of the year last year, you all saw Aga, we were arrested out of Aga, and the casualties, everybody can quantify. And guess what? They weren't enough with it. So they said, Aga is not going to be that consequential, uh, and we're going to come back with a severe form of sanction. And that's how HR 66 have come to play. Okay, and this has nothing to do with the government. One iota. Uh, I want to pause here for a minute and I will just say this. As you and I speak today, the United States has imposed sanction over 43 countries around the world. And you know what is the most amazing thing? None of the governments that these sanctions have been put on, none of them have collapsed. None of them have, in fact, have been hurt by it. Their lifestyle has not changed, okay? And a good example of that is North Korea. In fact, it is the longest regime to face U.S. sanction, over 70 years. Not only that the ruling party hasn't changed, is actually run by a dynasty of a family for three generations to the point that you've got a state that has become a nuclear power until you go to North Korea and you meet the people and then go to South Korea, which never faced US sanction. And these are the same family of people, brothers and sisters of Koreans who speak the same language, who have the same history and whatnot. But one has sanction for 70 years and the other one doesn't. And when you see and compare the livelihood and how the people of Korea in both countries they're living of standard. North Koreans don't have anything to eat. And South Korea is the fourth, fifth, uh, fifth largest economy in the world. That's what sanction means. So when it comes to Ethiopia and the level that they are going to put on as much as they have done to Iran, as much as they've done to Cuba, as much as they've done to North Korea, uh, when it comes to hurt Ethiopia, it will not hurt Ethiopia uniformly. Not all regions are going to be affected by these sanctions. There are going to be some regions that are going to hit really hard. Who are they? The ones you mentioned, the one that have faced war and destruction. Amhara, Afar, and Tigray. So now the current estimate of rebuilding post-war uh, reconstruction in these regions would take anywhere between five to seven years to do it. If this sanction comes to, to in line, God forbids, we're talking about 20 years to rebuild the Amharas and Afar regions. So we need to pause and say, are we signing on for this? Is this what we want to have to happen? We know it won't hurt the, the, the government. We know the U.S. In fact, has already implemented a sanction regime against the Ethiopian government officials, and it didn't do anything. So this is what the question have to come in. Now, is there human rights violation? More than I'm willing to accept, more than any one of us can bear, that innocent people, mothers, Pregnant women, children who don't even yet know how to speak yet, are being slaughtered in Ethiopia, and particularly in the Amharas. And but that issue is not an issue we can export to somebody else for us to take care of it for us. And the reason I say that, and I say it with passion, is because there has never been a history. The United States has ever done that for any Black African country, never, okay? Even the most heinous genocide that have taken place in our lifetime, and that of Rwanda, over a million Tutsis lost their lives. The United States did nothing whatsoever. So no matter how we're passionate about this, that the United States never had a history 
over the last 110 years of working on having a diplomatic relationship uh, with the African states and starting with Ethiopia, okay? Nor does it have currently any plans to do this. But why are they doing this then? Well, if it is not for human right, because a human right issue is not a national issue, it's a global issue, it's an international issue, you know, because human rights does not have boundaries, it has no flags, it has no nationality. Every human being on the planet affects them, and therefore, that anyone can make a case about other uh, human rights violation that may take place in a distant country of a case that is, in fact, is close to themselves. That's why countries, when they join the United Nations for the first time, have to sign the human right declaration for promising to respect human rights within and to enforce in other countries. But the problem, my friend, is that this human right issue has been abused by great powers because it gives them the, the open road to be able to break the national sovereignty of many small countries and particularly in Africa. So what we propose is this, we recognize human rights violation in Ethiopia. It needs to stop. Not only that it needs to stop, people need to be accountable for this and that we need to make sure that we have a wherewithal and never for this to happen in, in our country, in our land. This is our issue. We cannot farm it out. We can't rent a great power from a, <laughs> a distant who has no history ever doing anything like this to come in to do this. But the reason is that what we started out this discussion minutes ago is that the United States have made a decision that TPLF as a political force must survive, must and me, must be made relevant to the political discourse within Ethiopia. And they believe that their interest lies better by making sure that TPLF survives. And therefore, they have plans for us. And they demand is that the, it, First of all, is that the United States would like to see quote unquote, independent investigator to go into Ethiopia to have better access. Well, what they mean by independent um, investigator, they are going to be the one who will elect the body that they will send to Ethiopia. And guess what happened? At the United Nations in Geneva, um, the Human Rights Council, even though they already have a report that came to them saying that there is no genocide in Ethiopia, they pushed that report aside and they said, well, we need to send our own investigator back into Ethiopia and United States help. That's what we're asking on HR 66 as well. And about two weeks ago, they finally voted on and elected three countries to be a member of the team that will go into Ethiopia. Who are they? Kenya, Gambia, and the United States itself. Okay, so the United States, at least we know, it's a biased party to this. Who are the Gambian and the, uh, the Kenyan? It turned out to be, they are in fact, stooges of the United States. Throughout, known and through their career, basically take orders like TPLF will take the orders uh, uh, that we have seen. So you could almost say a Team USA of three are going to have access to unfettered access into Ethiopia. To do what? To do the following. First, they indict us. That's what Chairman um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Bob Mendes and uh, Gregory Mix did on this resolution. They have already determined that there is genocide taking place in Ethiopia. Then they send their investigator to confirm it. And then they say, well, we already knew that. And that's what they did in Iraq when they basically said that Saddam Hussein has a weapon of mass destruction. They wanted to send their investigate inspectors and they agreed that was the case and the rest is history. Are any Ethiopian willing to give a license 
for this type of manipulation of a body that have no credibility whatsoever for being balanced and judicious to do this kind of investigation. More importantly, why are we do not make our own government accountable ourselves? So we say the following. These are two issues that are very important for Ethiopia. And both of them don't have to be contradictory to each other. We need to defend the human rights uh, issues in Ethiopia and prosecute it. And uh, on, on the other end, we need to refuse um, to powers like the United States that are bringing up almost an iron curtain tie where it will literally disconnect Ethiopia uh, from the international financial grid and uh, send us into the dark ages for generation to come. And these two issues, are both ours, we need to claim them, we need to advocate for them, and that's what we swear to do. And I hope, and I hope that, like you said, Egypt is behind it. By the way, they have put three, one of the biggest uh, lobbying firm from K Street against uh, Ethiopia, so are the TPLF. And so we need to be extremely cognizant the fact that if this is what we want, that the people of Amhara, the people of Tigray, and the people of Afara are going to be the one that will pay the price. And finally, that I want to say this. Politically, there is a bigger danger that, <laughs> that we all need to, to, to discuss it. It's the elephant in the room. And that's Walkai Tagade. The United States repeatedly have said they don't recognize Walkai Tagade. They, to this day, they call it Western Tigray. Their biggest political argument is that that region needs to go back to the where it was for the last 27 years under TPLF's rule. So when they force the Ethiopian government to come to the table to negotiate with TPLF, guess the biggest stake that is on the table to negotiate, thanks to a resolution of HR 6600. And are we willing to compromise that? So this is the time we need it. This resolution would never hurt the ruling party. It will never hurt because we've seen it with the other 43 countries that their leaders and their governments have not been affected. 99% of the burden and the if, if, in fact that it's going to come is going to be the, the ordinary people in Ethiopia. And then finally, and finally, truly, I wanted to say this. We need to have a dialogue. We need to discuss. This is not to incriminate anyone. There are some really, truly genuine good people on both sides who really passionately believe in this. But no matter which side we are, we still are true Ethiopians. And therefore we need to respect each other. We should not call names of, of these genuine Ethiopians that have truly uh, could not find any other solutions that the bitter test of this carnage that is taking people in place in Afar and Amhara has compelled them to choose something like this. But there is a better choice. And the choice is that we need to be the owners of this issue and prosecute both cases together and tell whether it's US foreign policy makers or legislators to say, leave us alone. And that we should not accept these resolution as a final conclusion uh, in the way that they want to interfere with our own internal affair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deacon. Uh, I wanted to add on that. So uh, if you can explain to people with the, the freedom of speech that can be affected for you and I by supporting, by saying America should not be getting involved as part of HR 6600 that can affect me. So I wanted people to really understand that part too, please. Okay, so real quick, um, Ethiopian Americans, and Eritrean Americans should be very proud that we have this new designation because we have brought 
into the front play of American politics, something they have never seen since the creation of this great country. And that is a, an African indigenous diaspora group who boldly would come out on the street, boldly goes to the halls of Congress and demand that the policy doctrine that the government has, in fact, is not something that they will support. Not only that we've done that, but in the election that, uh, that took place in Virginia, with the gubernatorial, uh, that we basically took away the votes from the party we thought is, uh, we're thinking is responsible for this uh, ill-guided uh, foreign policy and they made sure that the other party became uh, 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 the one that uh, got our, our reward. So if you are a policymaker, this is a new phenomenon. Remember this. When they went and bombed Libyans, Libyan Americans never went out and made their voice heard. The same thing with Syria, the same thing with Iraq or Yemen. Who are these people so courageous? Where do they get their, their, their courage for them to come in front and, and literally challenge the administration and Congress for that matter? They, these people need to pay a price for this. So don't be surprised. They're coming after us. All of the Ethiopian Americans, regardless when you got your visas, you could be like me who came here 45 years ago. It doesn't matter. They can tell me now to pack up and go. Or somebody like you. You have a media and a free speech and it's up to somebody in Congress or the State Department to take your word and say, that was a hate speech. And they can ask you to leave the country because we taught them something. We showed them something that nobody else has done. And now they're coming after us. It's not only that. You can't invest in Ethiopia. If you have properties, if you've got any investment in Ethiopia, it has now, if this thing comes to fruition, it is a one-way ticket. Whatever there will not come here or whatever you've got here cannot be invested in. That's what they did to Cubans, okay? So even money and remittance that we send to augment to help our families, that is also part of that disconnecting Ethiopia from international uh, financial grid. Uh, don't forget, we Ethiopians, the diaspora, has sent 3.6 billion US dollars to Ethiopia in 2019. That's more money than the United States, EU, United Kingdom, World Bank, IMF has given to Ethiopia. That's power. Thanks to HR 6600, that may not come any, anymore. So we need to look at this thing in so many ways that this is a complete sanction, short of an embargo, where ships cannot even unload, you know, uh, uh, imported to be to import stuff to Ethiopia. Short of that, this is a truly an iron curtain, and we need to pause for a minute and say, really, is this what we really want? And you know, aside from political issue like Wilkai Tagade and all the other regions uh, in, in, in northern world and whatnot, but these are things that is going to come here. The issue is we're going to be now under a completely uh, a different level of surveillance. And by the way, it doesn't stop here. Say there is an Ethiopian who's submitted a, a petition to enter the United States. This bill asks when they evaluate to issue a visa for that individual to go back to history and say, is he one of those guys that you were protesting our, against our policies? In that case, you need to deny him the visa to enter the United States. So this is um, one of the most consequential uh, of our lifetime. And it, 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 is, it is a teachable moment that they, they want to teach the rest of the world what not to be, to tell them that don't be like Ethiopian Americans.
Don't be like Eritrean Americans, and we're going to pay the price if this thing comes to fruition. So we have every reason for us to fight tooth and nail uh, for this thing not to happen. I love the way you put it. And then I say, I'm an American, I'm an Ethiopian American. I served in the United States Army here. And it's my American right and duty to fight this bill, not just as an Ethiopian, but as an American. Not only it's illegal and it's coming in and sneaking and putting one thing that has nothing to do with it. And we know about bills, Deacon said it earlier. Most of the senators don't even read the bills because they're like, some of them are 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 page and someone, an aide sneaks in something, a page somewhere else. And then it becomes the president signs it and it stays there for 30, 20 years. People, we need to understand, we have to educate ourselves. That's why I called it on the flyers. Like this is a reverse. This is another way of colonialization. We need to understand that's coming through our mind and it's coming and it's divide and conquer in plain sight that we are seeing it. I am, my mom is from Tigray and my father is from uh, uh, Mahara side. I have a uh, Eritrean grandfather. Wow. I, there is nothing that I want this peace to come. I mean, I want the peace. I want the people the hurt. Every single person that's getting hurt is hurting me deep down. I bet. But I cannot just sit and then just look at this and then just say, oh, America is going to decide. Deacon said it, the Rashid said it. There is not a history. One person in here can show me. American has went in and cared about human right. Then I'll stand still. There is not one single proof for that. So let's read it. Let's be educated. And this is our life that we're talking about. And this is my freedom of speech that we're talking about. This is my generation after generation that's going to be affecting us. Let's not be fooled by this. I know, Deacon, you have an engagement. I want to make I, sure. Go ahead, please. I want to thank you. And I just want to say as a departing, I am very envy of your heritage. I wish I was like you. Mm -hmm. I will be born out of every ethnic group in Ethiopia, from Ethiopia. Um, I don't have ethnicity. I have only one ethnicity and that I am an Ethiopian and it is enough. It's more than enough for me. But more importantly, as Ethiopian Americans, your kids, my kids are Americans. This is the only country they know. We are Ethiopian Americans. We're not Ethiopian Chinese. We're not Ethiopian Russians. So what does that mean? What that means is we wanna see the relationship between Ethiopia and United States to be in a good and strong standing, beneficially for both countries, without one, you literally try to break the veil of sovereignty of the other. And if United States pushes Ethiopia to the brink, just pause for a second, what good is gonna come out of this? Let's say this thing passes. Let's say they put all the sanction 20 years out, 10 years out, Ethiopia become a failed state. How is that going to serve the interest of the United States? How? National security, economic security, geopolitical factors, all of this is going to be disserviced. So I think we need to advocate not only of the, of the, from the Ethiopian side, we need to advocate also for the interest of the United States to say, exactly. our minds need to prevail on exactly. this. Exactly. Because we will all lose, even if we don't agree with everything that the government does, we will not be able even help to you once you bring down this veil and really put Ethiopia in, in the path of destruction. And that's what I think the lesson that we need to advocate. I, I, and I, I want to thank everyone for being patient to listen to, to me. Uh, you're very gracious. I, 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 if I didn't have an emergency to exit now, uh, and I, I will, I will go back and read. I promise of the discussion you will have, and uh, I thank you for your graciousness, uh, you and uh, and Ato Yoftahe. Deacon, we learned so much from you and all the time. So continue, please. We will be your soldiers. Let us know where you need us to show up, uh, whatever we need to do. So. I'm your great admirer, and I'm learning so much from you. So uh, may the Lord bless you because uh, you've been a true Ethiopian, true American for everything that you have done. So it's really an honor, and we understand that 
you called in so many places. So this is an honor and uh, you gave us enough time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Deacon. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, good night. Wow, that's all I can say, but uh, what we learned from Deacon. So uh, let's break it down. This is our time uh, to try to understand uh, what had been happening, what we learned from Deacon and then from all the bills that we have been reading. Uh, let me do this. Let me go to Mami first, and then uh, then I'll come to um, uh, Fisaha. If you have the PowerPoint presented, what I wanted to do for people to understand, one, if they wanted to read it, where they can go in and understand, and they can read this on their own also uh, be informed. So, uh, so uh, Fisaha, if you can maybe prepare the PowerPoint while we are so that because most of it have been discussed, but I really want people to really have the bullet point to be able to take away from this. So while we're doing that, Mame, from what you have heard and then from what you have prepared, uh, what would you like to share to the uh, viewers, please? Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually okay if you really want to put the PowerPoint first, but if it makes sense, I don't mind going next. I know we've heard quite a bit, um, and what I wanted to do as I was preparing for so, this really is go over some of the sections of the um, bill itself. Believe me, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I highlighted some of the areas that I wanted to make points on. Um, and I know Deacon Yosef actually gave us the whole mm. package in a nice way um, for us to have this um, this kind of discussion. So I'm, I'm actually focused today on HR 6600. Um, and I have areas that I wanted to um, focus on. Whoops. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead into the PowerPoint since he's sharing it? I can wait. Okay. No. Sure. Oh, oh, I mean, I was going to actually, um, as you were saying, basically, I was going to show the six to six, you know, hundred, and then you can, you know, obviously talk about it, but you it's can, definitely if, had a bunch. If it's point. not too destructive to people, sure. That's fine. Um, okay. I, I can quickly go over some okay. of this, you know this section. Me, okay, go for it. Okay. Sorry, my bad. I thought it was just good actually showing the PowerPoint, but that's good. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, like I said, highlight some of the, the sections that I thought is interesting and it's good for us to understand from the the details, like lay person. Like when I pick it up, mm -hmm. you picked it up, somebody picks it up and you read it. And you're going, what in God's name does this mean? So I just wanted to highlight some of the areas that I thought would be good for us to, to talk about and to maybe have um our you know wrap our minds around it. Because I know Deacon Yosef said a lot, uh, and there are some points mm -hmm. I want to raise in that, in that in, in from what he had said. So if you when you look into the, the body of the document itself. A lot of it is, is repeated stuff from what we already taught, some of other bills, some of the resolutions. Um, I started counting the word genocide across this document. I got tired and I left it alone. They're, they've tossed the, the term uh, genocide everywhere in this document because as we all know, um, TPLF's narrative has been surrounding the word or the term genocide, right? Um, a lot of the different things from the very beginning, some of the stuff, um, it, it, it does combine everything that we've been fighting for or we fought and those things didn't go further, but all those different terminologies, the, the phrases, the sections, the different things that they've been talking about, they transferred to this because what well, it didn't work then, but they continue to carry it over into this bill. Because as Deacon Yosef um, put it together, they just throwing everything they can, put it together, see what sticks, right? But I'll get to the point where they were also hiding the little knife in it. As we were looking at this document and you would say, yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that because that's what I felt uh, when I first read it. I'm like, okay, so this is not news. This is not news. This has been done, da, 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 da. Uh, We've handled this, we've talked about it. Why is this back? But then there is that little um, things that they included. So I, I've already talked about the genocide. Um, it, it's interesting that they will continue to talk about it because the, the document would never address or the document does not address who is the corporate of that. 
I, it, it, this this document, let's, let me just say this document focuses it on the Ethiopian government and Ethiopian government only. Um, even though we all know that the, the start of the conflict, and I will, I'll pick up some of the terminologies here, the start of the conflict is TPLF. TPLF has never been held responsible in any of it. In this document, there is not a single statement that is directed towards TPLF. And I think um, Deacon Yosef gave us the reason behind it, right? They want TPLF to remain because that's their gateway into Ethiopia. If we've settled that, then what reason would they have for them to be in our business? They want TPLF, not because they want TPLF to do amazing things for Ethiopia, but TPLF is the reason, the only reason why they will have an upper arm over Ethiopia. So they're going to continue to talk about the stuff that's been talked about and addressed, such as access to humanitarian, genocide, all that different things. And in some of the documents, they actually talk about um, things that has been addressed uh, by even the media that has been necessarily completely dishonest about it lately, they've been reporting it, right? They, they had independent reports, the, the independent report came out. Yes, there is this, there is that. And then, yeah, you know, we, it was disproved that what TPLF has done is also this. I mean, they have reports that is casting light on what TPLF has been lying about. Let's just say that. Um, I will get to the meat of this. I, if you go like through the document, the very first few pages, it talks about humanitarian um, access. Um, it talks about genocide. Like I said, I started counting so many of them. It talks about um, diplomatic engagement. It talks about um, violation of human rights, um, all these different things. So I am going to actually um, take a look at some of the sections um, that I thought was interesting for them to include. I'm not, I'm not gonna take too much time um, since we've kind of stayed all, already an hour. I will quickly go through the ones that I thought maybe is important. So I'll just pass this. Okay, um, on page five of this document, section 11, it says um, one of the things that they're talking about is they want to address threats due to ethnicity, religion, political, or geographic affiliation, or affiliation with the United States against Ethiopia's Ethiopian citizens working for the United States government agencies in Ethiopia. If you really sit down and actually start dissecting this document, once again, it does not point finger to, to TPLF, but it's indirectly putting it back on the Ethiopian government. Um, it does not necessarily address who the, like I said, who the, 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 outside of saying this is TPLF, this is TPLF, this is TPLF, it's them, it's them, it's them. Honestly, it just does not address it. It states it there, okay? We, the, the whole sanction that they're putting here, the areas that they want to focus is making sure, okay? So um, if they were to address this point, they would have focused on who started this thing. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking about what just happened with Ukraine and Russia, right? So because Russia has done something and they started this war uh, and Russia is, is seen as the corporate of this thing, everybody, including the US is supporting Ukraine because Russia is in the wrong. And I know we're this big, compared to Russia and Ukraine, right? Because the Kenyusif said it, I have never seen or history doesn't tell us where the American government or American administration has spent that much energy for the African continent, right? We know, we know that, okay. And that's why I'm saying we're the big compared to what is happening in Ukraine. If the philosophy and the fundamental philosophy of how they do things is going after who's done wrong? Well, clearly we all know who's done wrong, but they don't want to admit it. I'm gonna go back to the bottom line. The bottom line is if they admit that TPLF has done this and TPLF has, is, is recognized as a terrorist group, they're not gonna have any kind of way into Africa, into Ethiopia. So they have to completely turn their heads up, pretend like they don't see that. They play with words, phrases like this, to really, uh, for somebody like me or anybody who picks up this document and reads going, oh my God, what's happening? What's going to happen to Ethiopia? I don't get this. That's what it is. 
uh, it talks about accountability. It talks about ceasefire. How long ago did Ethiopia and the administration of Ethiopia actually did that? Like I said, most of the stuff in the beginning of the document talks about things that had happened and already has been taken care of. I don't understand why it's here because this is what it means. They're compiling everything. It didn't stick then. Now we're gonna make it stick now because they have to have some kind of foundation for it. It talks about, um, let's see. Um, it talks about the whole, let me read this. In, in, on, this is actually on page six on section under the bilateral sanctions. Um, and then it, it goes into the subsection A. Um, actually, let me read this. In general, the president shall impose a sanction described in paragraph two with respect to any foreign party, any foreign person, the president determines A, has undermined, attempted to undermine or seeks to undermine efforts with respect to a ceasefire and negotiated settlement to end the civil war or other conflicts in Ethiopia. B, is responsible for complicit in action or policies that expanded or extended the civil war or other conflict in Ethiopia, has committed gross violation of internationally recognized human right war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide and other atrocities in Ethiopia, has obstructed, delayed or diverted or seeks to obstruct, delay or divert the provision of human, uh, humanitarian assistance for those affected by the civil war or other conflicts in Ethiopia. We all know who's done that 100%, right? We all know that this isn't necessarily appropriately directed towards who has done this, who is preventing humanitarian from getting to the people, who is in the trenches of making sure that this war isn't going to end because they continue to desire the attention of the international world. I mean, they're kind of poking and prodding and doing all kinds of stuff. So once again, somebody needs to question really the legitimacy of this. I know people talked about that fear. Okay, so as I am, um, and I think you have said it, I am an American. It talks about alien versus a US citizen. I love how they continue to call people alien. This is 2022 and we still call people alien. Do you see anything coming out of my head? <laughs> I, I find it very offensive, but you know what? That's what we are to them aliens so we must be an alien that came from africa let's just tell them what's what and and i think we were talking about it we we're saying we're on to something here we're we're saying no more in a in a way that why am i an alien like we're we're pushing the you know the limits we're saying uh -uh, you know and maybe a whole lot of other people have done it i know the african americans have been fighting this fight for years and every time i talk to some of them what I hear is, keep doing it, mommy. It ain't going to go away in just a year. Trust me, we've been doing this for however many years. You got to keep doing this. You can't be faint hearted, right? So I, I hope you could see this. This, this says, this is the little book that says the, the, U, the US Constitution. Fascinating facts about it. I apologize. I am so sorry. Um, so I have been reading this, you have no idea how many times. I lived here, I won't tell you how long, long enough that I should have known this, where then when. We lived here as peaceful citizens, right? And we're, they're teaching us, we've learned quite a bit. We were finding our voices. And the way we're going to find our voices is by knowing our rights, by knowing what this country is founded on. The founders had better thinking in establishing this country and its constitution to even divine who is a US citizen and who ain't. Let me read you a very short one. I promise it won't be long. So a US citizen, it says, and now I'm gonna, okay. Um, how about I make it a, an assignment for you all? This is actually free, you know that? You can find these things free. I bought it for a dollar when it was on the sale. On sale. Um, I did highlight it and for whatever reason I can't find it, but a, a US citizen is really defined here. And a US citizen is either a US born or an, an alien 
that was naturalized here in this country. So I'm an alien. I'm, I'm sure you two are an alien. I'm not sure about Rashid. I think he was born here, so he's a US citizen. But in the terminology itself, we are US citizens. So when it talks about pages after pages after pages, visa restrictions, um, if somebody was going to try and come to this country, you're gonna have to be looked at this and da 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 da. And if, if an individual was to do certain things like sending money back home, wanting to invest, doing different things, this document talks about how it's going to prevent an individual from doing this thing. So what I was looking at is, so as a US citizen, what right do I have? Is this even illegal for this sanction to stop me from doing what I want to do? Where does it fall? Uh, read amendment 14, human rights. My right as a person, if this country believes in, in, in human right, then the founders, like I said, have a better sense to define what that means for all of us. And the question we also need to ask and we need to uh, educate ourselves with so that we have the confidence as we're doing this is to say, um, according to the constitution, right? Uh, uh, and then, you know, the rights that we have within the states as constituents, what rights do we have? As citizens, what right do we have? Because it, like I said, when you, when you read just face value, this, this document, it makes you want to feel, it makes you just want to kind of hide because it's pretty intense. It's pretty compounded. You know, it, 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 it induces that fear factor because you just don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Am I going to be able to uh, keep a job? Am I going to be able to actually live here long enough? Or is this going to be an issue for me? According to this, without a uh, uh, um, due process, nobody can just show right up and say, you know what, mommy, we decided we're going to take away this thing from you. Because you know what, right now, yes, I am an Ethiopian. And when I did this and I pled, I pled allegiance to the American flag, guess what? I am full hearted American as anybody else. I can, I said this before, as much as we're willing to fight and do whatever it is that we want to do for the country of Ethiopia, because we have that connection because our origin is from Ethiopia or Africa. I will be the first to also say, and I've said it before, I am willing and ready to fight for this country because this country is my country. I lived here longer than I lived in Ethiopia. My children are 100% Americans. So learning your knowing our rights and coming at it from an informed place is going to help us because I think Deacon Yusuf has done an amazing job telling us in a nutshell what it looks like. Um, let me tell you, it also talks about exceptions, okay? Exceptions to visas, exceptions to certain things. Um, and what, I have, what I've been saying from the onset of this war, and I am actually following it and I'm hearing, I'm, I'm hearing scuffles about it is, oh, there is always this, this exception. Let me tell you the exception that I'm paying attention to and we all need to pay attention to and open our eyes, um, especially when it comes to this whole alien versus you know, um, a US citizen uh, visa. Am I gonna be able to go and come back or am I gonna be able to have, you know, people are gonna come, be able to actually come here and, and obtain visas and different things there is an exception to it, uh, uh, special visas. If you don't know um, the, the actual terminology, it's, it's called special visas. Um, just like from Afghan, just like from now Ukraine, that we see people come uh, with the special visas, they will be granted, excuse me, special visas to come here to the United States as political, whatever special visas. They could be sometimes called interpreters, they could be sometimes people that have done work for the US, CIA work, anything and everything that they have done to, for this government, this bill is already preparing an exception for that. There is already, and I don't know how this is happening, so I can't prove it, but there is already, and we've been talking about the whole um, refugee and asylee system being infiltrated by people that have committed atrocities back in Ethiopia in the area of, you know, in Tigray, and also people are completely ready to make up some stories and straight up from 
an area that was not even impacted to say, hey, I did this and this happened to me. We all know about them stories and actually show up here. This, this bill is preparing a little bit of a, a loophole to bring those people here because that's the exception. That's the special visa, okay? Um, and that's why I think Deacon Yusuf was saying, certain people are not gonna be impacted. The people that you would think should pay the price and should be impacted are not going to be impacted because they, when it comes to them, there is already a loophole included in here for special visas. Oh, they've done this, that, and the other. How do we know? How do we know that people that have committed atrocities, how do we know people that have committed war crime are not the ones that are considered um, for the exceptions? What, it doesn't say anything about this. It just says, you know, it, it plays with words and all the different sections, I'm trying to finish all of them and I haven't had a chance to actually read all the different sections that they're talking about, tracing it back to the original document and say, what did it exactly mean? Because when you read it in this context, it means something. But when you go back and actually read it from the original document itself, it's a different story. Who's going to do that much work? We all need to do that because uh, we can't walk around here and live in fear and saying, oh, they're going to come and do this to me so that I can't speak out. Um, I am not necessarily 100% on that, but I'm not asking people to do anything that they're not comfortable to do. So we talked about special visas. Um, Amendment 14. There is a section here, section DI. It says United States person. Term United States person means, can you believe it? They, they're defining the, the term person. A United States citizen, an alien lawfully admitted to permanent residency to the United States or any other individual subject to the jurisdiction of the United States or, and then it continues. So when you look at amendment 14, let me quickly, it's page 49, I just remembered. Um, I agree. It's, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up, I promise. Um, here it is. So it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. This is just one piece. That's why I'm saying we all need to go back to the, to the basics. We all need to go back to the constitution that even governs this administration. Correct. They need to be held accountable also. Somebody needs to sit here and dissect this document to even say, uh, is it even legal? Do they have the legal grounds to do what it is that they're about to do? And I know, I know they're 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 citing all kinds of different things. Uh, they've done it before. Um, Ethiopia is not the first. This thing is loaded. It talks about taking away money for from certain areas. Not there was one thing that I thought, well, at least that was some kind of positive. Uh, one of the exception talks about the suspension of amounts when they're talking about money suspension. So using American or US votes, Ethiopia is about to be suspended for any kind of loan, any kind of trading, any kind of anything related to financial. So if there is a hand or any involvement of the American government and Ethiopia is trying to do any kind of investment or any kind of money loan of any sort, the US is saying using our vote, we're gonna shut it down. So anywhere and everywhere the US is and Ethiopia is trying to do business in any, in any way, form or shape, they're going to use their vote and shut it down. That's what it means, um, except there is exception. And the exception is the suspension of amount under um, subsection A shall not include amount authorized to be appropriated or otherwise made available for law enforcement border security, including land, sea, and airports of entry or um, other activities conducted in coordination with the government of Ethiopia that are in support of United States national security objectives. Wow, one thing. So they're not gonna take money away from keeping the border. Now, 
you know what you can use if just said right what was that marina agale oh yeah but we're concerned about when it comes to border keeping we're gonna make sure certain borders are going to stay intact and we're not taking money away from borders but when you when they talk about armed force they're also taking money away from that. They're sanctioning the funding that they're giving for that area, okay? Including training, materials, spare parts, all kinds of things that Ethiopia could be getting in terms of maintaining any kind of armed force stuff. They're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're, they're taking money or, money or they're, they're sanctioning. There is exception to that. Not a whole lot. Uh, so I will talk about the the one point that I want to make and then I'll wrap up my thought. Okay. Another thing that this document that I, I thought we, we should know about is every now and then towards the, the back of the document, it starts to talk about negotiation. The Ethiopian government is going to be forced to sit across the table and negotiate until the Ethiopian government is able to handle whatever it is that they are supposed to be negotiating about this whole um, genocide, um, war crime, um, all the different things, um, humanitarian access, um, um, hate speech. These are the main things that they're talking about. Hate speech, genocide, war crime, uh, humanitarian, right? All in all, if you really were going to put this wrap up and put a bow on it, what they want is to make sure that the Ethiopian government is going to be uh, forced to negotiate. And I wouldn't be surprised if they even have the terms for the negotiation. Um, it does talk about some interesting things. I don't have much, much time to get into it, but the bottom line is that this sanction is bilateral. It has political, uh, um, context to it, it has economic context to it. It has all the different things that we've heard from Deacon Yosef earlier. The reason why we need to know this much detail about this document, and it's it's actually open document, anybody can download this and print it and I try to understand it, is that so if you understand your right as a US citizen, you have the right and have that conversation with your um, elected officials. It's not enough that a handful of people are doing this. It's not enough that four people or five people or 10 people are being vocal about it. It's just not enough. Your children needs to be empowered. My children needs to be empowered. The American people need to be aware as we started this conversation tonight the, this country, as Americans, we have enough to worry about, right? We don't even know where our grocery is going to go in the next few months, based on everything that is happening in the face of global pandemic and all that stuff. And yet the US is kind of, if it wasn't, I'm sorry to say this, if it wasn't what just happened between Russia and Ukraine, I don't even know where this would have been. But that was kind of a nice destruction, I think, in my mind. I could be wrong, but uh, more of us need to do this. And it's not just kind of going out there and screaming about it. We need to know how to play the game. And the game is to understand the bottom line. The game is to understand the law of the land. The game is to understand our rights. The game is to educate ourselves. The game is to be involved and not antagonize one another. That's not going to serve us any purpose at all. I'm not claiming to know all or everything. I know what I know. And from the little bit that I know, if I can learn from everybody else and I can actually add to my knowledge so that I can do maybe one or two things, you can imagine what happens in the collective then. The collective comes together and we're a force to be reckoned with. We antagonize one another it's not gonna serve a purpose because now they're not even hearing us because we have our own issues until we handle our own issues. We're sanctioning each other. We're sanctioning our, our, 
uh, like I'm uh, in doing or not doing of something is is causing pain to every one of us, right? I mean, we're we're hurting the bigger picture. We're hurting. We're digging the the hole even deeper and wider, and we're putting an, a noose right around our own neck and swinging off of a tree. God forbid. It, the way I see it is that by standing quietly, being indifferent, or honestly, I just don't care, or I'm too overwhelmed to do anything about it, isn't the way we need to, to go about it because we all need to be on the front level. We need to add our voices together. We need to understand it as much as we can. And uh, if I have my way, I think we need to have lawyers lined up. Like I said, the people that understand even better than we do, the constitution, the legal, the legal aspect of things and saying, can we really just allow this document to go forward without having some legal aspect happening to it? Because we can surmise to one and, and say, this is what we think is happening then. Um, but we need to really have a better grasp of, of what it means. And, and my final my final thought in this is we're not hurting anyone, we're not harming anyone. The bigger the bigger picture is bigger than any one of us. It's not about me, it's not about Yoftish, it's not about the four people here, it's not about the 10 people out there, it's not about who wants to claim fame. Go right on ahead, claim all you want. But what we need to do is save the country first. The bigger picture is. We've got to fight for the country first. You know, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this in Amaringa and then I will end. Zinjero majamariya makamajayina lecha. We need to have a country that we could say we have a country. Or we could remain to be an alien. Yes. We are an alien for this country to this day. This, this document is proof that we're, we're considered a foreign person. That's the one point that I didn't mention, a foreigner or a foreign person. And that's why I wanted to bring this out and say, I may be a foreign person, but this says I'm, I'm a US citizen. And as a US citizen, I get to enjoy certain rights and the responsibility that comes with it. So um, I think we need to take time, break it down, understand it. I just want to empower everyone and say, you have a voice. Yes. No matter how small you think your voice is, add it to everybody else, and then it's a voice to be reckoned with. When we separate our voices, it's nobody hears it. When the voice comes together, is really, really forceful, and we can learn from others that have been here longer than we have. I've always talked about the Asian community. They, 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 are, they have ethnic groups just like we do, but they know how to come together for the common goal. They have identified what brings them together. And when it comes to those things, they're like this. We need to find what brings us together. We may not see eye to eye with everything, but we have got to come together for the things that um, is a common goal for us. And for that purpose, we need to add and put together all of our voices and be heard. We're not being heard right now. So thank you, Yoftish. Um, this is what I have to say at least for tonight. No, no, thank you. No, I agree with you. Uh, definitely, uh, Rashid and uh, Fisaha. Um, uh, just like you said, I mean, one thing that I definitely wanted to address is like, we have to speak up. I mean, I think Napoleon Bonaparte said it well. I'm gonna say it, uh, I think he said, uh, 10 people who speak, uh, who speak make more noises than 10,000 who are silent. So exactly. we cannot be silent. We have to speak up. This is not something that we can just be ignoring. And uh, you mentioned about earlier, Rashid and uh, Fisaha, when you're ready, let me know. Um, one thing I want to make sure, like, I mean, when we get organized and we always, I always look at the Jewish American politics, how strong they are, how they get organized and their say, what they say, what they can do for Israel is because they get together and they have one voice that they can all share. So we have to learn a lot from our Jewish brothers and sisters, how, how they organize and how they need to they need, get to be heard. 
I'm going to go back to the bill so that we can summarize it. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to bore all my all our uh, panelists here. They kind of dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> They're back. <laughs> They're back. <laughs> so while um, Fisaha is getting ready for the PowerPoint, Rashid, let me come to you. And just I just said about the organization, you and I have talked about like how we need to get together, how to create that political voice so that we can be heard with the numbers and everything else because the senators or anybody else, they hear, they look at the number and we have to come up as one voice. So if you can speak on what, how to get organized makes sense and why a Jewish American may have more voice than any of us divided and then just trying to come against any kind of bill that can be passed against Ethiopia. Well, I, I want to thank everybody for their words today. Um, very inspiring, very informative. Um, I think the deacon said it the best, um, especially speaking about um, Glenn Youngkin's victory um, in Virginia, which uh, was pretty much a huge uh, upset uh, for the Democratic Party. And, you know, we're, we're not being partisan here, but, you know, uh, these bills are coming from members of the Democratic Party. And um, it's just a fact. Those senators and the House, those are Democratic senators and House reps that are pushing this bill. And we're coming to a very interesting election in 2022, which will determine who controls the House and the Senate. And I'm not telling anybody to join the Democratic Party, join the Republican Party, or continue to be politically hope, uh, homeless, um, aka independent. But this for the Ethiopian community, Eritrean community, you have a very big opportunity. Both parties are vying for votes in diverse places. And again, as the deacon said, this is the first time we have really seen a diaspora really fight against foreign intervention into a, into a country. We have seen the Cubans in Florida um, who are very upset with um, the, uh, the, the Castro regime, um, and they do everything in their power in Florida to ensure that whatever president is elected is tough on Cuba. Uh, they do that. Um, you know, that's one group that sticks out that, that does this type of, uh, lobbying. But when you look at African groups and groups throughout the world, when there's a war, um, there's not many, there's not much push pushback. Uh, I don't know how many Ukrainian groups in the United States besides just, you know, Americans um, find the Ukrainian flag for solidarity, but I, I have not seen Ukrainian citizens come together uh, in the large masses before what took place in their country to say, hey, you know, we want to raise a flag, you know? So the Ethiopian and Eritreans, I don't want to forget the Eritreans because they're very pivotal in this particular um, situation is that you're, if you all come together and vote together, you could change a lot of the local elections that are taking place for Congress. Right. You could change the, the tune of the Senate elections that are taking place throughout the states. And you could even change the tune of a presidential election in 2024. So it's very important that uh, as you have this group here in Massachusetts, that all the groups will start to come together and plan and organize. And you need to let your House of Representative members and senators know that you are displeased, you are not happy with what is taking place, and that you are going to be reviewing your options very carefully when it comes to the ballot box. So it's a, it's a thank great, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. I mean, you said it well, we have to get organized and we have to be heard because the only thing and the only voice we have to vote. Once we become the U.S. citizen, not voting, I think it is a crime for me. You have to speak with your voice. You have to make sure to speak with your vote. We have to participate as I'm an, as I'm an American as anything else. So I, the only way I can be heard is by voting. So I need to exercise that. Fisaha, let me come to you because we need to bring this all together. There is a nice presentation that you have. If we can share the PowerPoint and bring it together. But at the same time, while you are doing this, I want to give you a voice right now with what you have heard. 
and before you share the PowerPoint or you can do it during the PowerPoint, what would you like to say? What would you like to share based on what you heard from Deacon and then what we have discussed in the past? What does this mean to you? What are these two bills means to you? Yeah, um, I mean, really the what we uh, witnessed today uh, by the Deacon and by Mami, and of course what Rashid actually has stated, it's really, really a wonderful material. Um, and I don't want to go uh, in, in, in any uh, length, you know, talking about what the bill does and how was it drafted because Mami said it well. And then of course, Deacon really uh, stated um, beautifully. Uh, it has both the intellectual and the emotional aspect of it for us to really understand this at a gut level so we can actually do something about it. Uh, what I really want to state, what uh, Rashid kind of mentioned, uh, what, are, what is the solution? Yes, we need to tap on our, what we have done during the No More movement that was just bad. We need to really go back and reflect on it. What has inspired us are actually to come together as one people, as an Ethiopian, that can really defend you know, uh, our right, yes, but our nations, but who we are about as one people. We need to remind our people. We need to really inspire our people by those words. And we need to actually bring it back because guess what? Stuff is coming. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution now? The strategy is what we need to think about it. I think Mam may uh, probably uh, kind of hinted earlier we need to have people who can really look deep into this and lay it out in a very layman term that everybody can understand, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily level. So we can really identify with this. So we don't really play that blame games. You know, someone, so I don't like, so, you know, this parties are actually doing this because it's not my, you know, it's not something that I'm supporting or Abi is actually does this. I don't support it or I am from this ethnic. We can come up with all kinds of excuses. So in the end, you know, what do we need to do in order to actually stand up, make our voice heard and really be proud of mm -hmm. about what we have done. So the solutions are, what are our strategies? Yes, we have done it like a couple of months ago, but we, yes, we still have to do it. But should we actually include people like, you know, Rashid, the African-Americans, mm -hmm. you know, the white Americans? What are we working? Can we actually really start spreading the words? Should we actually use our family using all kind of phones, really make a phone calls and then actually do all the petitions? So we need to really branch out, uh, guys. We need to really branch out, really, and have you know, our voice heard through, you know, uh, the people that really has um, some understanding about what's really going on around, you know, the world. So let's, let's, let's come as a people and let's rally our people first, of course, and then really uh, engage in the community like, you know, our brothers, you know, for, you know African-American, white American, a, a work or what have you. And then maybe we can we can we can make it happen because I know from what I've heard earlier, these guys are not going to come. You know, this not this, this, you know the bills are actually ready for us. So we need to really strategize it uh, better. Uh, before I even actually go to the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint basically speaks to what everyone is actually uh, is talking about. But if you look at the sanction that actually done uh, that had sanctioned oh, um, um, uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is probably is a great example. Uh, what happened? And of course, they were actually giving you all these excuses, but the opposition party of Mugabe was actually in support of the sanction at the beginning, right? Oh, because of the violence, because of the rigged, uh, rigged um, uh, elections, because of the corruption or mismanagement of resources and what have you, and they use our differences. And they, you, they tap on that. They are so smart. They really know what they were doing. And they are actually beginning to crack our, our, our union 
And then they use that as a flag. They use that as an excuse to advance their interests. And we know why Zimbabwe is being sanctioned. Of course, we, you know what we, Mugabe did. And he basically, you know, punished for, you know, the, um, because of the land form, the land, you know, it's all about the land reform, as you know, yeah. under the late president, you know, Mugabe, that he basically displaced the commercial farmers. And that's what the sanction is all about, because he kicked them out, right? The people that's actually not, you know, and we know what Kenyans, you know, we, we, know, we know the African history anyway, you know, the colonial legacy. They're the one who's controlling the resources. They just want to get in. But in our case, even worse, look at our neighbors. Look who we were bounded by. First of all, we look how we completely, dis we're beginning to be disfranchised under this ethnic, ethnical problems, right? So we have to really heal. We, we need to come up with them. And then if you look at our Sudan, Kenya, you know, uh, look, uh, you know, Egypt, it's going to be even worse. Zimbabwe's are actually better because the neighboring countries are actually helping out. So we need to really think through what we were doing in order to actually, you know, uh, save, you know, uh, this nation. So um, strategy is yes, let's do the petition. Let's make some phone calls. Let's use all kinds of phone calls within the family, right? And let's definitely, you know, bring more people into the pool. And let's do all the, ra the rally and then use our social media. If not, we basically losing, you know, what we, uh, uh, you know, what's before us. So uh, the PowerPoint, if I can, you know, share it. Uh, hang on. Mm. Um, can you guys see this? <clears throat> yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So yeah, this is the PowerPoint that I just did last week uh, to our friends. Uh, it shows, of course, this is HR 66. And of course we've been, you know, the dangerous bill for Ethiopia and the friends of Ethiopia. And this is the person who basically introducing, you know, the, uh, the house bill under, you know, um, <clears throat> stabilization, peace and democracy. You know what that means? And it states definitely what he, of course, this person, I mean, uh, I can't even really uh, uh, pronounce his name, but Molonsky, Molonsky, Tom, you know. Yeah, it's exactly, yeah. Uh, it's a Democrat from New Jersey. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, the pre, um, and then that was the day that's actually introduced. Primarily, what it does is actually, it can crunch it in five points. The most important part being actually the security suspensions. You know what the security does to Ethiopia. If you don't really have your, it weakens our, you know, sovereignty. You know, it further destabilize, you know, our, you know, that region. And they're really going at it. Definitely on finance, it revoked the economical development of opportunity. You know, anything that you can actually get loans, financial gains, any kind of technical support or assistance, you know, it completely, you know, uh, denies that. And then, of course, the, the third main point is the investment. This is the area that I want the Ethiopian American or any American who really have an interest in investing on Ethiopia can be what denied. Prohibiting Ethiopia from U.S. or international development. But we, it, I, myself, as an Ethiopian, whether, you know, I cannot do anything. I cannot invest. Of course, it, Deacon talked about it, the remittances of the, almost what? Uh, in 2019, was that 2019 or 20? Yep. 3.5 billion. billion. Think about that. Yep. You know, we cannot do, I, my, my, I, I, I have families. I can send money at times. And I am basically being revoked from that privilege. And we need to really think about this. How many of us actually have a family back home? That's critically important. And of course, the investing aspect of it is another, you know, another issue. The basic right. You know, the bill definitely attends on uh, the, you know, the you can't, we can't even have actually, you know, um, a right to, you know, penalizes us from, um, you know, from going, I'm, I'm going to move this, um, supporting the people of Ethiopia. You know, our right, obviously whether supporting it financially or out of uh, expert, anything, anything, 
you, ha you don't have any kind of right what to do in that nation. So we need to really, uh, um, and the final one obviously is the immigration bill. How many of us actually, I myself that are actually came before 20 plus years, but you know, you can, you, the DV, which is the diversity visa that everybody knows that could of course gonna be revoked or any process, you know, that, in, in that you were trying to bring your family or your loved ones, that's not gonna happen. Why? It's because you have problems with the, pre, with the, the, the present government or because of your ethnicities that are actually at some sort of peril and then you don't, you're losing all this, your privilege. So we need to make sure we have to bring it to, at the level, at the scale of, you know, this immediacy, at the scale of us, at the scale of actually one-on-one, -on -one, you know, even if we have a problem of actually thinking of it at the scale of a nations or, you know, a continent. So it's important that what do we do? How are you actually connected to back home? So we need to really, you know, uh, see this. And by the way, uh, the other bill, which introduced, of course, by Bob Menendez, yep. it exactly does that. Yeah. And it's beautiful, you know, if the three article, you know, section three, of course, the first, second, the third talks about how Ethiopia is, had a diplomatic, you know, a relation for a century or not. And then of course, the second one talks about that nation has a political, you know, a powerhouse in the continent of Africa because of the AU and, and whatnot. And the third, it's beginning, of course, the fellas are actually, at, since Abi came to power and yeah, he pretended to reform all of the good things and all of a sudden things actually start changing. So from that on until the 20, the, there is a 29 findings that he, that, that the bills that are actually liberally stating entirely about Ethiopia, what Ethiopia and the Eritrean troops have done. Nothing has, nothing with the, uh, you know, the TPLF. And we know why, we've already had it. So uh, the point being is, let's go back and then what should we do? How, do should, how, should we, how should we go about it? What are the strategy we can use? We, need, we, don't, we don't need to be always a reactionary, but we need to actually you know, think, you know, find people, and you know, come up with you know uh, a solution. Like you know, we were uh, you know make our voice heard. Use the social media, of course, and branch out. It, you know, branch out to other you know uh, people, Africans, of course, they can understand this. So uh, so uh, so my, the point being is, uh, yes, we have to be united. Yes, we have to understand this, but we need to. Um, you know, branch out and do more about it in order to actually, you know, uh, you know, a curb, you know, the problem that we have. So, uh, so that's what I have. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much, Fisa. Yeah, because yeah. I'm gonna, we will uh, in the process of wrapping up uh, our program. Um, because I need people to understand at the end of the day, it's not about supporting any kind of group right now. We're not here saying support Dr. Abi, support this group or any of that. Please read the bills. Please understand who is supporting it, who is funding it. There's a saying in American saying, I always say, follow the money. And just like some things that you may be angry about right now, Please think about for generation things that's gonna hurt. So don't be emotional, be smart, make the right decision because this is not something that's gonna help or defeat Dr. Abe. You heard it, over 43, 43 countries that have been sanctioned and the governments are mm. not failing because mm. of sanctions. The people are suffering, the people are fleeing, they're becoming an immigrant, they're going on boats, they are flying all over the place, they're going out and dying on the streets, on the highways. It's sanctions do not hurt the government. Whoever is in power stays in power, yeah. actually, because by destabilizing the people, by making them suffer, you make them even more dependent on the government. So this is not something, it's not looking for money from America. This is about Utopia having an independent investing and rebuilding and being able to have a relationship with other countries. This is all going to prevent all of that. 
So we have to be smart and not be here. And then we have to understand where it's going. So I want to give all of you. Um, before you wrap it up, though, can I just say something real quick? Yeah, I'm going to give you all a closing statement. Look at so me. that's um, what I was going to do. Uh, so my may I'll start with you then. So here's your I think uh, probably Rashid wants to go first. I'll, I'll, I'll pass. That's OK. Sure. Rashid, go I ahead, please. I was trying to wrap it up, too. Thank you um, for, again, this <clears throat> great opportunity. I just want to say this as an American, it is very vital um, as Americans that we are very um, cautious about intervening in the affairs of other countries. Mm -hmm. And as American citizens, we must start, to, we, we got to start talking out, out against this. We've seen what happened yeah. in Afghanistan. We've seen what happened in Iraq. Our intervention into the business of other countries results in more problems for us. We have a bunch of problems here in the United States. Gas is through the roof. Food is through the roof. Millions of our, of our citizens are homeless. Millions of our citizens are starving. We have bigger problems here. And also as Americans, we must respect family business of other countries. We're not here to take sides um, in this conflict. We are here to promote peace and wish for the best for our Ethiopian family and our Eritrean family. And to the Ethiopian people, um, we spoke about Ottawa a few weeks ago. We spoke about Menelik a few weeks ago. We spoke about how the tribes came together in Ethiopia to fight for their freedom and their sovereignty. It's a very important fight that you all are undertaking. This is a trial. And, the, and you have been blessed by God to have a beautiful country with a lot of beautiful natural resources and a strong culture. You are not going to be able to be blessed with such history and such a great country and not be tried. So it is on you as a people to decide your destiny and decide how you handle this trial. You could break, you could give in, and you could destroy your country for generations to come, or you could stand up um put aside the differences and think about those who are in ethiopia who are dying and suffering we're here in the united states i mean we have our problems but we're not dying and suffering like the people back home and it doesn't matter what side of the spectrum they are people are dying and suffering and my last words is um i think this is the most important part is as i mentioned when we had our our previous meeting we have become our own worst enemies we are doing to ourselves what the colonizers could not have ever done. Exactly. We study, I, I, the, the deacon mentioned $30 billion. Is that correct? Yes. A billion. How much? 30? Three, I'm talking three. about how much, no, no, I'm talking about how much money is being invested into these lobbyists. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Billions of dollars, but the people are hungry and poor. The people of Tigray were suffering really badly before this even happened they're mm -hmm. hungry they're starving they're people starving yet there are groups of people who have so much money yet there are those who are their fellow countrymen who are suffering and poor we unfortunately do worse to each other than our colonizers have done so this is just a wake-up call that we need to treat each other better as black people and we need to take better control to invest in our countries and make them equitable and make them decent and safe places to live. And we need to really, wherever it is, speak out against those who are exploiting the innocent and the weak and the poor and allowing on, people on both sides who are poor people to kill each other while others sit and benefit and continue to be rich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashid, with what you said. And then especially when you say Adwa, it just reminds me what was written for the in Italian and what was written in Amharic was completely different. That's what ended up creating the war. And this is exactly the same thing here. They said was human right. And they add so many things in it that's going to be for generation lose your independence. So that's a very good analogy that people need to understand. This is just like the Wichali agreement, mm, people need mm. to be able to understand what is written in this bills. Mm, it's going to mm. hurt for generations after mm, generation. Mm. So um, thank you. Thank you, my brother, Rashid. I understand you. everything that you've been doing. So we're going to be working a lot together 
because this is just we're just starting in this journey because education understanding the bills and understand being playing part of the american politics is part of where we need to stand up and speak up yeah. to be able to have a better voice and then we need to come together as one people because at the end of the day we are more we have more in common than divide us so um thank you for that so thank you thank you mommy let me come to you as a closing statement and then i'll go to Fisa. Awesome. It's, it's hard to kind of uh, close such an interesting conversation, but thank you so much again, Rashid and everybody else that was here today as a panelist. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm energized, I'm encouraged, and I heard everything that's been said today, and hopefully I will put it to some good. My closing statement is once again, um, based on what I said earlier, we, we talked about strategy, we talked about coming together, we, we talked about being organized, we talked about educating ourselves and knowing our rights um, and going back to, to the founders, right? To the, the, the basic, I mean, the, the letter of the law. And what I like to say really is, there is so much to be said about empowering oneself and empowering a community and empowering everybody else. We're not alone in this fight. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I think the African-Americans have been fighting this for many, many, many years, and there's so much we can learn from them. Resilience, uh, not losing height and not losing sight of what it is that, that they're fighting for. We need to continue doing that same thing. We need to keep our eyes on the prize and the prize is making sure that we're not going to be a victim of whatever that we've seen other countries ended up being a victim of. We do not want to create Libya out of Ethiopia. Um, we cannot throw, I'm gonna say this, we, we cannot throw the baby with the bad water altogether. We have to know how to discern, we have to know how to sort out. We have to know when to say, I know I have these questions and I have these differences, I'm gonna set them aside right now because what I need to do is make sure that I have a stool to stand on so that once I know my foot where my footing is stable enough, then I can do these other things. And I think prioritizing our um, efforts is important. And the last thing I wanna say to our own community and I'll, I'll add one more thing is that, like I said, antagonizing one another isn't the way. I think Rashid said it. We do it to ourselves worse than anybody has done it. Um, I've been to um, the official uh, offices and I have spoken to so many of them, if not once, multiple times. In the recent months, what we are hearing is literally, mame, you all are not on the same page. If we cannot be on the same page on what was happening prior to this bill, I can only imagine what's going to happen trying to deal with something like this that could outlast us. We just heard that this thing could be generation long, past me, past my kids. Do I really want that to be my legacy? What did they do and what, was, what happened for Ethiopia to be like this? We have responsibility, obligation, and a part to play, uh, to contribute to history. So to our community, now is not the time to split to so many different places. And then um, if by any chance, if Americans are listening to this, whether whatever kind of Americans, are, it's not even about color, whether you're African-American or just American right. people, human beings, citizens of this beautiful country, we've learned from history over and over. This isn't the go about, this isn't about to go in any way shape or form that benefits Ethiopia or benefits the United States either. Um, we talked about us being citizens and I could say this again, as it is citizen, as an American citizen, um, we also contribute to the country, you pay taxes, right? Um, now is not a good time for this administration to really engage in another war. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, we do not want to see a single American coming back from Africa in a body bag. We do not want to see a war. We don't want to repeat of Libya. That's not what we want. We don't want to make something like this to define Ethiopia. Um, I want us to open our eyes and our ears and be diligent about what's happening. Uh, if we don't know what, what all it means and we're dependent on four, five, six people to do it for us, we're going to have a bigger problem than we have today. It's not about 
just a handful of people doing this, the entire community, everybody, including our children, needs to be vested in this. I already talked about how certain systems are being infiltrated, which is the immigration system. We need to peel our eyes open. Why is it possible for certain people to have that exemption, that special visa uh, based on uh, the stuff that's happening in Ethiopia, based on the, the, the suffering and the, the, the atrocities, right? Where is the fairness and where is the equity? So if immigration is going to, or whatever exemption is going to be afforded to people, how can we be of a voice to also other people so equally to be also afforded that? How do we know that certain people that are the reason for the atrocities aren't going to infiltrate the system, show up here and make it so hard for you and I to live in peace? How do we know that? So all I'm saying is, Open your eyes, open your ears, don't dismiss it. It's not about two people, it's not about four people. Do not antagonize anybody's effort. Whether it's big, whether it's small, go out and do something. Do something, one thing a day towards supporting the effort. It could be somebody you may not necessarily like or you may not necessarily appreciate, you don't necessarily know, it's not about a clan system. The clan thing ain't gonna work this time. We need to be bigger than a clan. We need to be together like a clan, but it's gotta be bigger than just my clan ain't gonna do this. It's not me, myself, and I, it is all of us together because Ethiopia is facing big time stuff and we all are needed. You're empowered. If you hear me say this 10 times today, I'm happy, I will say it again. You as an individual empowered. Every single person, especially women. I'm coming for you, especially women. I know you have it in you. Uh, many, many moons ago, we've done um, some kind of workshop back in Ethiopia that said empowering women is empowering a nation. So be empowered and go empower because you know you have it in you. We need a lot more women to be voiceful, uh, to, to voice their reason. Uh, you, you, we all know we know how to do certain things. And when there is a women behind certain things, we've seen some incredible things happening. So I like to encourage women to also pay attention, do what you can. Somebody had talked about making phone calls, sending emails, um, be proactive. So we're not chasing this thing. It's we're not chasing. We need, we need to be in front of it. We need to be proactive instead of reactive. So I know I said quite a bit, but thank you, Yoftish, for creating this opportunity. It's an ongoing discussion. I want to see more effort. I want us to come together because trust me, the system, the people, the enemy that do not want to see Ethiopia thrive, and be successful and be what it can are loving it right now Definitely. because we're polarized. Definitely. They're loving Thank it. You. Thank, so you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mami. If it's high, let me come to you or would you have a closing statement? Yeah, mine is just really, again, uh, it's on the reach out. It's on the solutions, uh, what we uh, should do uh, as a citizen. You know, I think we have talked a lot about it. So uh, maybe in case, uh, what I want to say is for those people who want to uh, go and read the bill, all you have to do is that are actually on your browser, yeah. you know, uh, on your browser. Uh, if you look at if you look at this, you just you know type in you know on congress.gov. I mean, it can congress.gov, and that will definitely give you, <clears throat> uh, you know, Congress. So I'm typing it right now. .gov, and then all you have to do is are actually you know hit HR. What, 6600? Is that what it is? It's right there. You already have it on the bottom. I've already have it in the right bottom. There, you had it. I've already have it. There you go. Yep. So you can see it. Yep. You can see all the information. For those people who really want to read, you know, what the builds is all about, you can go ahead and click that and it will give you this. Yep. And then look at all the text. And this is text one is actually telling you, of course, what the build is all about right here, guys. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very easy, you know. Uh, and the same thing with um, 
S3199 as well. While you and were then, there, I wanted to show something. Can you go up a little bit, please? Yeah. <clears throat> if you can just show that alert, uh, get alerts right there. So for people- Yeah, so the get file, alert yeah. is ever actually- Right is, there on the top, like uh, left right. side corner. One more, one yeah, more. Yeah, I think there all is, the way to the title, I believe, one there down, you go. Right there. So yes, so that will definitely, there is, to get the email, let's uh, nation sign and create an account. Yeah, you have to you, you have to create an account basically if you want to do that. But you just need an email. Want, exactly. So the other thing is there are actually this is co-sponsored by the people who lives in Massachusetts. You can see who sponsored it. Look at that, James. This is a you know you click on people who co-sponsored, and right. he is where is he? Worcester. There you go. People so everybody my that district, lives there exactly. should go you after him. Go yeah. after him, guys. Go after him. You're a constituent. Yeah. You have every right to pick up the phone and talk to them. Exactly. Exactly. So all I'm saying is that actually this thing is very easy. Every information mm -hmm. is just right under your fingertips. And then all you got to do is actually make a phone call. You know, it's right. This is the 202 area code, which is actually the DC one. The DC but, one. Yeah. You know, there he has his own website. If you, you click can, on it, thank there you. There you go. You can click on it. Yeah. And then here is the website right there, guys. Yeah. all of the information that you need so what i would recommend to everyone is if you really want to you know educate yourself about the bill or what's going on if you want to get more updates and who who sponsored it who co-sponsored it you can get a direct information and then you can do something about it and you can tell how to you know you can educate others that are actually how to do it and this is how we can actually be how we can be uh, very active as a citizen, as a community, as a nation. And then we can be very, very, very powerful. Guys, so this is, all, this is my last word. So let's really focus on the solutions, what we can do, what's on our hand, and, uh, you know, what we can actually make a difference. And that was... I just want to add to that, though. Um, if you need information, if you need any help at all, I don't know what to do. There are so many different groups out there. Ethiopian public diplomacy is one. You can reach out. You can Google the website. You can find us there. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to your fish. There's so many groups out there. You just need to, you know, it's not about belonging to something. It's participating in what's been happening. So exactly. uh, we're here to help. I'm more than happy to reach out um, to respond if you reached out. Like I said, Ethiopian Public Diplomacy Network is what my group is, at least. There is Yoftish's group. There is what? Um, Ethiopians for Brighter um, yep. Ethiopians for Brighter Future. Yep. Um, yep. I, I can't call all of them out. Get, no, I know. Get Fact is actually Get one Fact of the, is the one another the thing. There is um, we... Author's Voice. There is yeah, already a um, petition out there that we need everybody to sign not just Ethiopians, Americans. If you happen to be working with somebody, show it on their phone, share it with them and say, could you just sign okay. this? In any case, uh, so that's the last thing that I would say. And thank you very much because I got to run myself. And yep. uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just like everything says, don't be a follower, be a student. Everything is at your fingertips. You don't have to listen to anything that we have said to you. Yeah. Go find out for yourself, educate yourself. And then make sure that you know this is going to hurt yourself. And at the end of the day, I want to close this. I suffer for the Tigrayan people, Amara, Afar. A lot of Ethiopians are suffering right now. None of us are sitting here and saying that those sufferings are not happening. Mm -hmm. But the only way we can do is by coming together. TPLF is going to go on at some point. Dr. Rabi is going to go at some point. But the rest of the people, we're going to have to make sure to support them as much as we can. So TPLF hasn't done anything for the Tigrayan people. That's for sure. That's a fact. We have to understand that part. So the suffering is going on. We have to come together. Right now, you can see plenty of videos, a lot of Tigrayans leaving Tigray and going in the Amara, Amara region and with the people being together. And then because they all need those helps. Mm -hmm. So let's please leave this ethnicity aside and come together as human beings and support each other and i'm going to add this and i'm going to end it whenever you hear an atrocity when you hear someone is dying the first thing in your mind or in your mouth that comes out is like 
questioning what ethnicity that person is, you are part of the problem and you are the problem. Mm. So you need to be able to suffer and feel the pain for all equally. So I want to pray for our country, for Ethiopia and Eritrea to bring us peace. And we're going to get over this and we're going to come again together as one people to be able to defeat this. But do not let a foreign country or someone else come colonize us. It's something that's going to affect us forever for a long period of time. So peace be upon you. Thank you, my mate. Thank you, Fisaha, for everything Deacon has given us so much and Rashid. I appreciate you all. See you all again next week with different program. Yeah, no, one of these days, right? <laughs> follow, send me a link, anything, questions, and then we'll bring you more um, uh, amazing programs as much as we can every single week. So I bless you all. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.